Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the World Affairs Council and the Marines Memorial Association, I would like to welcome you to this George P. Schultz lecture. And tonight we are featuring the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joseph F. Dunford, Jr., United States Marine Corps, who will make remarks and will then uh, engage in a uh, dialogue with our board chairman from Marines Memorial, uh, Mr. Barry Graham. The Marines Memorial Association is a war veterans nonprofit organization chartered to honor the legacy of military service. And our programs are constructed to educate, to commemorate, and to serve veterans of all eras. The World Affairs Council, who's partnering with us in this presentation, engages the public in the most critical of global issues and connects the ideas that lead to change. And uh, their website is worldaffairs.org. Marine's memorial website is marineclub.com. And I would now like to introduce the sponsor for tonight's event, Secretary George P. Schultz. He's a United States Marine, he's an educator, he's a public servant, and one of only two individuals to ever hold four different cabinet positions. Please join us in welcoming the Honorable George P. Schultz, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. As Chris said, we have the great privilege this evening of hearing from the of General Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, top military guy in our government, and maybe it's not too much to say, top military guy in the world. Now, anytime, anytime a top general has a nickname among the guys down there fighting the battles of Fighting Joe, you know you've got somebody special on your hands. So he has done everything he has commanded in war situations at all levels. His performance is terrific. My colleague Jim Mattis down at the Stanford Hoover Institution says his execution is flawless. So I said to myself, I looked and he's brought up in the Boston area. Everybody in Boston is a Red Sox fan, right? <laughs> and, so, and he's a big Red Sox fan. I understand he has a Red Sox cap carries around. Well, the icon of all us Red Sox people, I've lived in Boston for a while, is Ted Williams. He's the last major leaguer to hit 400, and he could hit the long ball, but he never said anything much. So according to the story, he's walking along and some reporter grabs him and says, hey, Ted, why ain't you talking? And Ted says, I let my bat do the talking. <laughs> so according to Jim Mattis, General Dunford is quiet. He doesn't blow his own home all the time. What he does, he lets his performance do the talking. So he is a, a great leader for us in our country. We're lucky to have him. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce General Dunford. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, Secretary Schultz, uh, thanks for that introduction, but more importantly, thanks for your example of selfless service and in, uh, in leadership. I think you know uh, everybody that today wears the cloth is pretty proud to follow in your footsteps. And, uh, and General Myatt, sir, it's good to see you. You know, a number of people have said, thanks for being here, and I, I have to come clean. Uh, I didn't volunteer to come here tonight. Uh, <laughs> When, uh, when, when General Myatt, uh, who was known in the day as Cobra Six, when he was my Marine Amphibious Unit Commander and I was Captain Dunford, uh, when, when General Myatt calls you and gives you an invitation, somehow it seems a bit more like an order. And, uh, and so, General Myatt, I am here. Uh, I am here at the right time, at the right place, and I'm in the right uniform. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, there's a number of other folks here. I've had a chance to see some familiar faces and some friends, and it really is, uh, in all seriousness, uh, it is an honor to be here, and I, and I really am appreciative of the opportunity to come out here and see so many folks. And I, 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 won't, I won't recognize anybody else by name. There's too many people here, but, but I would say this, uh, because many of you fall in this category, San Francisco has a great reputation for taking care of veterans. 
and, uh, and many of the folks in the room, and I spoke to a couple of them upstairs that I had spoken to some years ago, have really focused on veterans transition and veterans health. And, uh, and I just want to say thanks. Uh, and you know who you are out there, and, and I'm appreciative of that. And, and again, I think, I think in part, General Myatt, again, with your leadership, San Francisco sets the stage. This also uh, is the 70th anniversary of uh, Marines Memorial. And, uh, and I would just tell you, with you at the helm, General Myatt, I think General Vandegrift would be pretty proud. Uh, were he to come back here now and see us uh, 70 years later, uh, it is a club that all Marines uh, can be and are very proud of. And I know uh, today it's almost synonymous. Marines Memorial and General Myatt, it's almost synonymous uh, with your leadership. But uh, we're, all, we're all appreciative and congratulations on, on 70 years, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, just um, before the question and answer period, I, I thought I'd make just a, just a few remarks. And, uh, and one of the first things I want to do is, is, uh, is talk a little bit about the men and women that we have in uniform today. I'm incredibly privileged to represent uh, almost 2 million uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that are on active duty today. Uh, it's a typical day. There's about 275,000 of them that are forward in 177 different countries, and they're doing everything from combat operations in Iraq and Syria uh, to protecting uh, our cyberspace and everything in between. You know, um, I'm, I am nonpartisan, apolitical. It's been a political year, and it's been, uh, you know, some things have been said this year that I feel as a senior uniformed officer obligated whenever I speak in public to make something clear. And, uh, and that is that the men and women that we have in uniform today are capable of protecting the homeland in our way of life. They can meet all of our alliance responsibilities and they have a competitive advantage over any potential adversary in the world. Of that, I am absolutely confident. We are recruiting and retaining incredibly high quality people and, uh, and they, are, they are on a day to day basis, I hope, making you proud. Having said that, you know, there are some challenges and, and when you, uh, in fact, I talked to at least one person who has insomnia and watched C-SPAN, but when you watch the, uh, the leadership in Washington on C-SPAN and, and we talk about readiness, we do talk about the challenges. We've been at war for 15 years and our people are running incredibly hard. Many of them still today are on what we say is a one-to-one -one deployment to dwell ratio and what that really means is you're gone as much as you're home. So whether you are gone for seven months at a time or 12 months at a time, you go on for seven months, you're home for seven months, you're back out for seven months. I visited uh, just about a month ago now the USS Barry. It's one of our, uh, it's one of our destroyers out in the Pacific. It's uh, in Yokosuka, Japan. Uh, and that ship over the past year has been at sea 70% of the time. And uh, for those of you that are sailors, you know what you do in the 30% of the time that you're not at sea you're training and you're maintaining and you're getting ready to go back out to sea. So they're, they're running pretty hard. And, and I could talk about some of our folks that fly, some of our intelligence people. I met some personal recovery folks in the Air Force. We got them all in a small school circle. I said, hey, how long is this deployment? They said, four months. I said, how long were you home before this deployment? They said, four months. I said, what about before that? We were on a four month deployment. And they're doing that on a, on a, uh, on a, routine, on a routine basis. In addition to just running hard, uh, our equipment, uh, airplanes, our, our vehicles, our weapons have all been used at a greater rate than we predicted. And so, you know, we're seeing some signs of wear and tear uh, in that regard. And that has been exacerbated a bit because of the unsteady budget situation we've been in over the last three or four years. So I guess my, my summary for you is that, uh, yes, we do have some challenges. Yes, those challenges are out in public. One reason why I'm uh, uh, always aggressive in talking about our challenges is I don't want our young men and women to be in a fair fight. That's not the deal. If, uh, if you're part of the United States military, you're not going to be in a fair fight. We want them to have a competitive advantage. So when we go up to Congress, we, with all candor, share the challenges that we have in an effort to articulate a requirement for additional resources so our young men and women have, in fact, the very best equipment, the very best training, and the very best leadership to be able to accomplish any mission. But I, I wouldn't want any of you to, uh, to believe that, that there's anything other than high-quality people in the force today and an ability to do the job. And as I'll speak about a little bit in a minute, my concern is not with 2016 and 2017. I can say to you with confidence that we have that competitive advantage I spoke about. My concern is that the individual who might be in my job in 2021 or 22 can say it with the same degree of confidence that I say it to you today, that we have a competitive advantage. 
What I thought I would do is just give you uh, maybe just a quick uh, view from my perspective on the security challenges our nation faces right now, and that may, that may set the stage for uh, the question and answer period. And uh, another secretary, former Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, has described uh, today as the most volatile and complex security environment since World War II. I've been in my job for about a year, and uh, I wouldn't argue with, uh, with Secretary Kissinger. Uh, I, it is incredibly complex. When we look at the challenges out there right now, we see primarily four state challenges and one non-state challenge. The four state challenges are Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. The one non-state challenge we collectively call violent extremism. It's referred to uh, in the Department of Defense as four plus one. And, uh, and we use that as kind of a benchmark against which to measure our current capabilities, measure risk, and, uh, and, conduct, and use it as a planning tool. What it's not is a predictor of the future. And, uh, and I would tell you, if, I've, if anything, over the past 40 years of active duty for me, if anything, I've become humble about our ability to predict the future. But many of you are in business, and you need to benchmark yourself against your mission, and against your competitors. And so we use that four plus one as a benchmark against which to evaluate our capabilities today. And we also pay particular attention to their capability development. And we look at where they may be three, five, seven, ten years down the road. And we evaluate ourselves against that as well. And uh, what I'll do is I'll just kind of um, tell you what I see when I look at those four plus one. And I'll start, I'll start with Russia. You know, we all know Russia has incredible demographic and economic challenges back at home. And yet, despite those economic and, and demographic challenges, they've made a significant investment in their military capabilities. They've modernized their nuclear enterprise to develop ballistic, uh, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, air defense capability, cyber capabilities, space capabilities, and a wide range of maritime capabilities. And they're operating in places and in a manner that we haven't seen in over 20 years. In fact, the last time that we really saw the kind of patterns that we're seeing right now was when I was with General Myatt, and uh, he was a Marine Amphibious Unit Commander in the mid-1980s. General Myatt, there is a Russian carrier moving to the Eastern Med today, and I can remember being out there at sea with you when bears were flying over our formation. And that's the kind of activity that we're seeing today with the Russians. It's significantly different. The other, the other thing about the Russians is you have to look at their uh, capability development in the context of their activity in places like Georgia, the Ukraine, uh, and the Crimea over the last few years. If you ask me uh, what, the, what the, the major concern is for the Russians, for me, it's two things. Uh, we draw our strength from my perspective, and this is looking at it through a military perspective, but I think it also applies to it from a political lens. We draw our strength from the network of partnerships and alliances that we've built up over the past 70 years. And the other thing that makes the United States uh, unique is our ability to project power. In the case of Russia, they're doing two things. Number one, their military capability is designed to prevent us from meeting our alliance commitments in Europe. And so they, all of their anti-access, it's called anti-access area denial capability. That means they're focused on trying to keep us from moving to the area and operating within the area. The other, the other thing we see with the Russians is they're trying to undermine the credibility of our alliance structure in Europe. And those are the two major concerns. When you look at China, uh, although our, our policy is certainly that uh, we look for ways to cooperate with China in the Pacific, uh, as a military leader, we also have to look at their military capabilities. And although China, particularly from the budget perspective and a capability development perspective, is much more opaque than Russia, you see some of the same issues. You see development of nuclear weapons. You see uh, increased programs for cruise missiles in particular, uh, high-end aviation capabilities. Some of you might have seen that. It was in the San Francisco papers even today. Uh, cyber capabilities, space capabilities. And much like Russia, they're focused on what we call those anti-access area denial capabilities. They know that our strength is drawn from our ability to project power and to develop a wide range of capabilities to mitigate the risk of our power projection capability for, for Chinese interests. And I also think that they recognize that the strength of the United States in the Pacific and the rebalance of the Pacific is in our alliance and partner structure in the Pacific. And what they do is, is work to undermine on a day-to-day -day basis the credibility of our alliances uh, in the Pacific. With regard to Iran, when I talk about Iran, I say the number one export uh, of Iran is malign influence. And, uh, and they are, with their uh, Al-Quds forces, uh, projecting malign influence across the Middle East. 
They also have developed a, a wide range of the same types of weapon systems that Russia and China have. In their case, uh, you know, it's a threat to both freedom of navigation in the Straits of Hormuz, as well as the Bab el Mandab, which is on, on, the, on the coast of, uh, of Yemen. Uh, North Korea, probably don't have to spend too much time speaking about North Korea. We've seen over the past year uh, tests of nuclear capability, development of ballistic missiles, development of intercontinental and mobile intercontinental ballistic missiles, which are of a concern. Uh, violent extremism is that fifth uh, challenge that I spoke about. And I think there's going to be some question and answers later about that. So, and, and that obviously is the thing that's most in the news. I guess what I would just say is, although the current focus is on the Islamic State, we pay attention, obviously, to Al-Qaeda and a wide range of other extremist groups as well. Uh, with regard to Al-Qaeda, I believe the pressure that we have put on Al-Qaeda, particularly in South Asia uh, over the past decade, has prevented another 9-11. And, uh, and that's why we don't hear much about Al-Qaeda today is because we have put them under incredible pressure, both in South Asia and in Yemen, which are the two strongest branches of Al-Qaeda. We are watching with concern, though, a resurgent Al-Qaeda in Syria. Uh, the uh, Shura and Al Qaeda Shura has risen in Syria, as well as the Al Nusra Front, which is a large group of probably nine or ten thousand, which is affiliated with uh, with Al Qaeda in Syria. From my perspective, with regard to the Islamic State, uh, while I'm not complacent and I don't take it for granted, when I look at the past year, uh, we have taken away a significant amount of their territory. We've limited their freedom of movement. We've eliminated a number of their resources. We've degraded their capability. And quite frankly, I think the most important thing is we've begun to undermine the credibility of their narrative with youth that have been radicalized by the Islamic State. Much work, to, much work remains to be done, but particularly in Syria and Iraq, we've had some progress. In Libya as well, I would tell you six or seven months ago, I was very concerned about about the trajectory of the Islamic State in Libya, and we've had significant progress, and Marines have contributed to that with Harriers uh, from the Mediterranean conducting strikes in Libya, significantly reducing the capabilities of, of Islamic State in Libya. Had similar progress in West Africa and in Afghanistan, all areas where Islamic States uh, were declared. Very quickly, just maybe share some of the implications of all that. Number one, uh, when I look at those four plus one, and you look at the United States, a nation that thinks and acts globally, I walk away saying that we have to have a balanced inventory of capabilities and capacities, that is the size uh, of the current force. And uh, we can't afford to be prepared for one one side of the conflict or another. We can't afford to focus on high end like Russia and China at the expense of violent extremism. As a nation, we need to be prepared for both. And that's what concerns me about the past four or five years uh, in the budget process is we have become a bit unbalanced as a result of some of the difficult choices we have to make. And in my judgment, in order to provide for our security, in order to be responsive across the range of military operations, we have some hard decisions to make here in the next couple of years. One of the other uh, challenges that I believe I see when I look at those four plus one is what I describe as adversarial competition that falls short of actual armed conflict. You know, we have a tendency to look at ourselves as either at peace or at war. And that model is very different than what China, Iran, or Russia, as the case may be, uh, looks at. And I'll give, you a ch uh, I'll give you an example with Russia. Russia combines economic coercion, political influence, information operations, unconventional operations, military capability and posture to advance their interests on a day-to-day -day basis. They, they employ capabilities, they use, they conduct activities that we would associate with conflict. And so I think as we look to the future, and I'm talking now just with the military dimension of what is actually a much broader problem, it's not a military problem, there is a military dimension to the problem, but this issue of adversarial conflict in dealing with Russia, Iran, and China on a day-to-day -day basis is something that we, have to, that we have to refocus on and is a key area of interest for us. The other, the other thing I would tell you is that conflict today uh, is much more likely to be transregional, multi-domain, that is in land, sea, air, space, and cyberspace, and multifunctional. And that's, that sounds like a lot of Washington, D.C. words, but what it really means is that, you know, in the 1990s, you could have imagined most conflicts, we had a regional strategy, and you could imagine most conflicts, we would have tried to isolate them to a particular region. And I'll use North, North Korea as an example. In the 1990s, you know, our response to a conflict on the Korean Peninsula would have been a land supported by maritime and air forces to either restore the 38th parallel in the Korean Peninsula or remove the regime in North Korea. 
Uh, North Korea then developed ballistic missile capability, and it became more of a regional challenge than just an isolated challenge to the peninsula. Today, when you look at North Korea and you look at the possession of intercontinental ballistic missiles, as well as those ballistic missiles that can, that can strike in the region, you look at their cyber capabilities and a nascent space capability, immediately a conflict on the Korean Peninsula also poses a threat to the homeland and to other regional actors. And the time and space associated with conflict today is much different, which makes the decision making, in my judgment, and, and we have at least one former Secretary of State and a Secretary of Defense here, Secretary Perry, sir, good to see you. I didn't see you when I first, when I first came in. Uh, but we, we have individuals here that, that uh, have experience in Washington, D.C. in making decisions, and I would argue that the decision-making space that our leadership has today as a result of the character of war today is, is very, much, uh, very much different. All of which argues for a greater degree of global integration in both our planning uh, and our execution, and that's another area of particular interest. With that kind of as a, as a scene setter, just again to give you from my perspective uh, the major challenges we face with the caveat that that is really a planning construct in a way to inform us as to where we are today relative to where we need to be in building a joint force uh, and not by any means a predictor. My assessment is that if we prepare for those four plus one, and we have an inventory of joint capabilities and capacities that give us the ability to deal with those four plus one, those four state challenges and one non-state challenge, then we will have the kind of joint force necessary to deal with what most assuredly we will have to deal with in the future, and that is unpredictability. So with that, I think I'll ask Barry to come out here and join me, and we'll go into the question and answer period. General Dunford, thanks very much for joining us today. It's an honor to have you here from 1986 that I'll just read briefly. Uh, that might be of interest to uh, those of us from the Marines Memorial. In the spring of 1986, the 26th Mao Marine Amphibious Unit was tasked to work with the Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC, on a classified exercise in the Mediterranean Sea that involved two company-sized Helleborn amphibious raids, one raid by JSOC and one raid by the Marines. The ships were involved, involved were the USS Iwo Jima and the USS Nashville. This was the first time that Marine pilots were authorized to fly using night vision goggles. There was no moon. The Marines executed the raid flawlessly, and it was witnessed at the target by Deputy FMF Lant Commander Brigadier General Corliss, who said he had never witnessed such a well-planned, well-executed operation. He wanted to know who the raid force commander was, so he contacted the commanding officer of the 26th Mao, Colonel Mike Myatt. For this exercise with JSOC, Colonel Myatt said, we had the best company commander we could find to plan and execute such a high profile raid. Captain Joe Dunford was the raid commander. It appears Captain Dunford has a great career ahead of him. <laughs> so the, a, little, uh, a few ground rules uh, tonight. Obviously, we're a week away from a very contentious uh, political election. Uh, and in fact, uh, General Dunford just sent uh, a message out to all active duty military recently, and I'll just read uh, a sentence or two from that message uh, because I think it's quite uh, poignant in how he worded this. What we must collectively guard against is allowing the U.S. military to become politicized or even perceived as being politicized by how we conduct ourselves during engagements with the media, the public, or in open or social forums. So obviously a little inappropriate tonight to ask any of those questions. So I'll start uh, with the first question. Uh, who are you voting for, Joe? <laughs> I, I was gonna write in General Myatt. <laughs> 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 And that's, is, that's, for, that's for his creative writing skills. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is when General Myatt, after a session like this, says, you know, there's a, a reason Graham never got above first lieutenant. Yeah. Hey, uh, General, on a more serious front, uh, on the counter-ISIL uh, update, um, could you start with our ongoing efforts in the Middle East? We know U.S. and Iraqi forces are today moving on Mosul as part of the counter campaign. Uh, can you give us an update on those efforts and uh, where the challenges are and uh, hopefully success going forward? 
Sure. First of all, for those that aren't following it, our strategy from the very beginning has been to identify effective indigenous ground forces and provide them with the training and equipment to actually conduct operations. So we have a relatively small footprint, about 6,000 personnel that are right now in Iraq, about 300 personnel that are in Syria. Uh, our forces in Iraq are supporting uh, the Iraqi security forces and the Kurds, the Peshmerga forces, as they conduct operations in Mosul. Mosul and Raqqa, Raqqa is in Syria, Mosul and Iraq, uh, are really the core of the, of the physical caliphate of the Islamic State. And so for the last 14 or 15 months, we have been focused on eventually getting to uh, Raqqa and Mosul. Those operations in Mosul are currently underway, and we expect that we'll begin isolation operations in Raqqa here fairly quickly. And we wanted to do that so it's complimentary that we have simultaneous operations ongoing in Syria and Iraq. But it's probably important to point out that our strategy as a nation to deal with the Islamic State has nine lines of effort, and only two, only two are led by the Department of Defense. And what can we do militarily? We can degrade uh, the Islamic State's military capability, and we have been doing that. Uh, we can disrupt their ability, and this is our number one priority. We can disrupt their ability to plan and conduct operations against the United States uh, or our allies. But we can't deal a lasting defeat to the Islamic State until we get after the underlying conditions that feed radical uh, extremism. And, uh, and so what you can expect to see in the coming months is, uh, I believe we'll be successful in seizing Raqqa. Uh, I believe we'll be successful in isolating and eventually seizing uh, Mosul. And that will eliminate what we call the physical caliphate in a sense that we'll no longer be able to declare that they have a proto-state. But uh, my expectation is they'll continue to conduct terrorist operations, they'll continue to conduct guerrilla operations in the Middle East, and certainly the narrative will still be alive and they'll start to, they'll increasingly rely on what we call a virtual state, which is uh, in the information space to, to again, radicalize youth around the world. I do believe, as I mentioned in my opening comments, that our success on the ground is one of the best ways to undermine the credibility of the narrative, and we have seen that uh, their brand of extremism has become a lot less seductive to youth around the world in the last few months as a result of the losses that they've experienced uh, on the battlefield. But, you know, it, it has taken us a long time to get to this point. When we went back into Iraq, we had to redevelop our intelligence network. The Iraqi security forces required a lot of work. For many of you who are in this room who work with the Iraqi security forces prior to, not, to 2011, we did a lot of work, and frankly, uh, the political leadership squandered much of that, and we had to rebuild that capability. But today, in my judgment, the Iraqi security forces are getting to the point, and certainly the Kurds, the same thing, are getting to the point where they have a competitive advantage over the uh, Islamic State. A little more difficult in Syria, uh, in a sense that the partners that are working on the ground are not as, is not as capable as the Iraqi, Iraqi security forces, so we're still working through that. But the only other point that I would make uh, to this group is that you know, the challenges that we have today in uh, Iraq and Syria are beginning to be a lot more about the political challenges and what I describe as the day after Mosul or the day after Raqqa, far more so than just the physical act of, of retaking ground away. Uh, we have uh, limited their freedom movement. We have taken away their territory. We have eliminated many of their resources, but there are political challenges both in Iraq and Syria that are going to have to be addressed in order for those two countries not to be a sanctuary from which violent extremism emanates. General, if we turn to Afghanistan, we've had 15 years of war there, a cost of 2,400 U.S. service members, uh, $850 billion, and the Taliban remains in control of 30 percent of Afghanistan. Uh, continues to launch offensives on provincial capitals. As a former uh, Afghanistan commander, what's the future of Afghanistan and do we still have an enduring interest? There? Sure. Uh, let, me, let me come back to, one of, again, one of the comments I made in my opening remarks, and that is uh, al about al-Qaeda. And, uh, and it is my judgment that uh, using Afghanistan for the last decade plus as a counterterrorism platform and building a counterterrorism partner in Afghanistan and on a day-to-day -day basis, putting pressure uh, on Al-Qaeda in the region has been the reason we haven't had another 9-11. In fact, we just t conducted a strike, and we haven't yet uh, confirmed that it was successful, but we believe it was successful against one of the last leaders of Al-Qaeda that's been in northeast uh, Afghanistan, and we've been looking at him for about the last four or five years. 
And, uh, and the pressure, our, our presence in Afghanistan has allowed us to put that pressure on Al Qaeda. And, and our interests in the region today, uh, if they were important a few years ago with regard to terrorism, arguably are more important today. There's a lethal mix of about 11 or 10, or 10 or 11 uh, terrorist groups in the region that uh, many of which have designs on conducting attacks here in, in the United States and the pressure that we're able to put on them, and more importantly, the pressure we're able to put on them by, with, and through uh, our Afghan counterparts is, is pretty important. Um, I look at Afghanistan, and uh, you know, there's certainly political challenges in Afghanistan, there's economic challenges in Afghanistan, there's the issue of reconciliation between the Taliban and the, and the Afghan government, and all those things have to be addressed. But in the meantime, uh, our focus is on making sure that we don't have an attack on the homeland from that part of the country, and our partnership with Afghanistan is allowing us to do that. And as a result of what we're doing for Afghanistan in terms of support for their security forces, as well as the economic support and development assistance that the international community is providing, is providing a space within which they at least have an opportunity to address those governance issues and long-term economic issues. But even if Afghanistan were unable to do that, I believe our presence is important, again, uh, simply to keep pressure on terrorism in that part of the region. And there are other national interests there as well. You've touched on uh, Russia, uh, General. The recent Russian statements, including on nuclear weapons, have been pretty disturbing. What do you think Moscow's goal is or their end game? Do they have a strategy? Do they have an objective? Well, first, on the, on the issue of nuclear weapons, um, you know, our, our president in 2009 uh, gave a speech in Prague and, uh, and one of the focuses of, of President Obama has been to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in our strategy. And unfortunately, at the same time that we have looked to do that, and I know Secretary Perry has written about it and spoken about it and advocated for that, and I think we would all want to move in that direction. Unfortunately, at the very time that we have worked to do that, uh, Russia has increased the role of nuclear weapons in their strategy and, and at least uh, in their declaratory policy, reduced the threshold that, that they advertise where nuclear weapons may be employed. Uh, Russia clearly, in my mind, is again trying to undermine the alliance structure uh, in NATO uh, in and around Europe. Uh, Vladimir Putin has those significant economic and demographic challenges in Russia. He's, he's focused on external problems to give him uh, some space domestically. So I think a lot of what we see is, is to play to a domestic audience. And at the end of the day, I think what, what Vladimir Putin would like to do is push back on some of the progress that was made in the wake of, uh, of the fall of the Soviet Union in the, uh, in the 1990s and, and reestablish something akin to the empire that the Soviet Union once was. Uh, is, is, I think, part of the focus of Vladimir Putin. A difficult challenge. We're not looking for uh, a fight uh, with Russia, but, uh, but certainly an effective nuclear deterrent is, is first and foremost in our mind from a security perspective, and also making sure we maintain the credibility of our alliances and that we're able to meet our alliance commitments in NATO is, is another one of our requirements. And most of us remember uh, not too long ago, we, had, we didn't have Russia, we had the Soviet Union. And just uh, if you'd like to go back through that history, there's a series called American Experience. Uh, and you can go through the Reagan eight years and weaving through those eight years, if you recall at the start, we had the Soviet Union, we had the Cold War. It was a very desperate time in our country. And Secretary Schultz's role, key role in that is weaves all the way through this eight year period. And if you recall at the end, uh, the Berlin Wall came down, the Soviet Union came apart, Gorbachev came here. So it's uh, uh, almost a miracle for those of us who were there at the start. So I'd encourage you to go back and, and read that. Well, just a quick comment on that, too. I, I mean, I think that when I look at what uh, Russia is doing today, it's about as unsustainable as what the Soviet Union was doing in the 1980s. They can't possibly sustain the path of military capability development. There's an increased percentage of the gross domestic product that's spent uh, on the military capability development. Their population will be 10% less in, two, in 2050 than it is today, and they've got 0% growth in their economy. And, uh, and so it's hard for me to imagine that Russia will be able to sustain this, but that doesn't necessarily make them less dangerous. So, General, if you turn that to the United States, you have to plan in a very uncertain time for budgeting for us. Uh, there's been talk of sequestration, different budget proposals, um, continuing resolutions. How do, you, how do you plan and how do you foresee the, the military support side on, from a financial standpoint? Yeah, no, it's been difficult. And just, you know, for the folks out here that don't, that don't have to pay attention to that on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and I wish you hadn't asked me a budget question. I, I, <laughs> I, I, uh, 
I, I, I thought I was coming out to California to get away from that. For, but uh, you know, we're, we have already um, been reduced about $800 billion from, what, from the resources that we projected would be available in 2012. So some tough decisions be made. And, and, and sequestration still looms large out there in the sense that there's another $100 billion of cuts that could come if, if we're not able to come up with a resolution to sequestration, which I think as most Americans now know is, is kind of a series of blind cuts uh, where we don't make decisions based on risk management, but just based on uh, automatic cuts made in accordance with the, uh, the sequestration process. What, what I have said to our folks is that, you know, we, uh, I think three or four years ago when we started dealing with these economic challenges and we started dealing with the operational challenges, uh, we made two assumptions. We thought that the, that the operational requirements would be reduced and we thought that the budget process would level out. And that informed the decisions that we made over the past three or four years. And what I've told my team now is that, you know, we'd be making a big mistake if we would have those same assumptions today. And, uh, and so we've looked at over the next 10 years and we've made what I think is a, a realistic projection of the resources that we have right now. Uh, most of our leadership would say that we can't meet the requirements of the strategy uh, at that level of resourcing. Uh, I'm not prepared to say that right now. In fact, I'm, I call to mind uh, frequently what Winston Churchill said, and I think a 19th century physicist said something very similar. Ladies and gentlemen, we're out of money. It's time to think. And so the, uh, the, the, the first thing we, we have to do is, is truly take a hard look at making tough choices and, and prioritize things. And again, that's where that four plus one is so important to us because we look, at, we look at our military capabilities through that lens and we try to make the tough choices to make sure we have what the American people expect us to have to meet our national interests. But, uh, but over time, over the next two years, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, figure out if, if this sequestration process is going to be avoided or not. And if we do get hit with another $100 billion, I, I think we're, we'll be at the point where, you know, strategy has, has ends, the things you want to do, ways the way you want to do it, and then means, the resources that are available for you to do it. And, and over the last few years, we've adjusted the means and we've adjusted the ways. But we haven't changed the ends. We still have the same objectives. And what I would tell you is, I think, uh, as I look ahead, uh, if we're not able to avert uh, continued budget uh, challenges, we're going to have to start to take a look at the ends part of the equation as well. Not only how we do business and what resources we have available to execute a strategy, we're going to have to take a look at the ends. And that'll require, obviously, not, that's not a military decision. That's a policy decision. But that's going to require the next administration to take a hard look at the resources that are available, the percentage of resources that we want to spend on defense, and it's not just the Defense Department, it's the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, the State Department, and so forth, and then, and then figure out uh, you know, where we are as a nation. And just as it may be an editorial comment, one of the things that I'm cautiously optimistic for in 2017 in the wake of an election is we can have a, an honest dialogue about our national defense and come to some consensus about our national defense. Uh, right now, I think that uh, there's a pretty wide divergence in terms of what does our nation stand for and what kind of capabilities does our nation need to have to, to protect our national interests. And, and that debate and dialogue, I hope when the Congress comes back in 2017, is one that we'll have. And that's certainly something I've said to many members in office calls and so forth is that you know, they said, what can we do for you, General? And I said, the number one thing you can do is, is, is help drive a consensus in national security so that we, we can all at least have some agreement on, on the fundamental principles. We'll have disagreements, but the fundamental principles. That's what we had when Secretary Schultz was, uh, was in our government. That's what we had when Secretary Perry was in our government. And that's what we lack today, which makes it very difficult from a planning perspective. So, General, we'll, we'll move off the hard questions there and move to uh, softball here on female integration. Uh, <laughs> over, over the last year, DOD... Mind, who, who picked this guy? <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, he asks that often. <laughs> Uh, over the last year, DOD has undertaken several personnel reforms, not the least of which is the integration of women into ground combat units. Can you give us your thoughts, how that process is going, and what you emphasized with the secretary to implement it? Sure. I'll, I'll answer the, the second question first. And, and uh, 
you know, the implementation is, a, is largely a service chief uh, responsibility, uh, but, but, you know, all the feedback from the service chiefs has been they, they're, they're going about doing it. Everyone understands what the Secretary of Defense's guidance was. Everyone understands what the standards are, and we did in the process of, uh, of integration go back and revalidate the standards, and, uh, and we are now implementing integration in accordance with those standards, and, and soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines are doing exactly what you'd expect soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines to do. Um, you know, my, my recommendation last year, um, you know, I mean, what, what I believe at the time was there were some issues that needed to be resolved before implementation. And so Secretary Carter and I had a conversation and Secretary Carter's perspective was only different than mine in this regard. His perspective was that we could address those challenges in implementation. And my recommendation was beforehand was to address those challenges before implementation. But I would emphasize, I, I gave the secretary seven criteria that ought to be addressed in implementation. And the secretary accepted all seven of my recommendations for the criteria against which we would measure our progress and the manner in which we would implement integration. And, and that's exactly what's happened. So uh, I, I guess maybe you asked the question because of my public statements prior to a decision being made, but I think everybody who's ever worn a uniform knows that once a decision's made, there's nothing going on out there across the joint force today except for uh, aggressive implementation in accordance with the decision that was made and making sure that we do it in a manner where we maintain standards, we maintain combat effectiveness, and we make sure we have the right men and women in the right places at the right time to accomplish the mission. General, two questions on uh, cybersecurity. What's the military's role in um, protecting us from cyber threats? And then secondarily, uh, would you comment on a plan that if we know uh, we're getting a certain cyber threat from an area, is there a military response and how would that be decided? Sure. Yeah. Our, our, the, the military role in the, inside the continent of the United States is to protect the Department of Defense's network. And, uh, and we do have collaborative relationships and there's many uh, members of industry out here and, and, uh, and certainly uh, in the tech industry out here. And we do have partnerships uh, uh, with uh, the private sector to try to help out. We do not have a responsibility uh, to protect the private sector. Uh, we don't have a responsibility to protect the U.S. government as a whole, uh, but we do have a collaborative relationship inside the U.S. government. We are a supporting agency to the other governments, uh, to the other elements of the government, the other agencies. And then with regard to uh, the private sector, I think we as senior leaders all believe that an effective private public sector um, cooperation is really going to be critical for us to have the kind of cyber defenses we need against the current threat. And I realize there are privacy issues, there are proprietary issues, there are you know just the uh, independence of, of businesses and so forth, all those issues involved. Uh, but that's kind of what our what our model is, is to try to develop based on trust, collaborative relationships with the private sector so that we can uh, make sure that the entire United States is safe, to re that we have resilience across the network. And, it, and if we knew of a, a cyber threat from a specific area, but it's cyber, uh, is there a military plan or how would... would sure, I, I would just say this, that uh, are we, if there's, there's a difference between cyber espionage which is no different than spying, and then a destructive attack in cyberspace. And in my judgment, a destructive attack in cyberspace, you know, you, you, are, you aren't limited to a symmetric response in cyberspace. Uh, what I owe the president uh, in the event of a destructive cyber attack is a full range of military options that are appropriate in responding to a cyber attack, but it wouldn't necessarily be just in cyberspace or frankly in cyberspace. Keeping with the, you mentioned some innovative technology, and we're here in the Bay Area, and, but also back in Boston, there's some exciting companies developing a wide range of innovative technologies. Many of these are early stage, and not only are around technology, but are reducing energy consumption. So the question is, uh, how do those early stage companies get adopted more rapidly into the military where you know, many of us feel they could be used right away, right. and yet there's, um, at least I can testify, there's a somewhat, um, you know, large bureaucracy and how do you approach it and how do you get there? Uh, so could you comment on how, what's happening today and how that might be improved that these, and some of them are represented here, young companies could be used in the field much more rapidly. Sure. No, I mean, I, I, I hope uh, most of you know, because I think Secretary Card has been out here two or three times at least uh, to have this conversation. 
you know, I think we recognize, he certainly recognizes it and has made it a priority uh, during his time as Secretary of Defense to outreach to the private sector and to make it easier. And he's established these centers uh, in order to do that, to encourage entrepreneurs to, to actually uh, be associated with the government and work on some of our problems. You know, I'll give you an example of, of, uh, of a problem that we have in, 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 a, in a way that maybe illustrates why we're coming out to the private sector to try to get the best and brightest for innovation, disruptive ways to solve problems that we have. You know, we have a, 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 an enterprise called the Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance Enterprise. That's the platforms and the processes that we use to collect the information we need to feed decision making. It's all based on our Intelligence, Surveillance, Reconnaissance Enterprise. Since 2001, we have grown the enterprise by 1,200%. Since 2008, we've actually grown just the physical platforms that we use. You know, these are uh, remotely piloted vehicles and so forth. We've grown the platforms by about 600, 700%. And today, you know, one of the jobs I have is to, is to do global force management, meaning we take all the capabilities we have and we, we give it to our operational commanders. I'm meeting about 30% of our operational commanders' demand for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. So in this five-year plan, we're going to go from, for example, in one area, 60 uh, of a capability to 90 of a capability. And at the backside of five years after doubling that capability, I expect we'll probably be meeting 30-some-odd percent of our capability. So well, in this particular case, you know, continuing to buy things uh, is absolutely more platforms, more of the same, is never going to get us to where we need to be. So this is a classic example where innovation is required, a completely disruptive way of feeding our decision-making process. And so, you know, we're coming out to industry to ask for ideas and help in that regard, because at the end of the day, we're not trying to grow our intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance enterprise, the one we have today, make it bigger. What we're really trying to do is find a way to feed decision-making which may look completely different than what we're doing today. In fact, I would argue it has to look completely different or else we won't be where we need to be. So I think the short answer is uh, the outreach that Secretary Carter has done and these centers that he set up around the country are designed uh, to bring people in to help them navigate the bureaucracy, as you described it, of working with the government to incentivize young people uh, towards government service, both as part of the government and also as part of the private sector working for the government. And so the incentives that he's put out there we hope will bear fruit over the next several years. And again, a key piece of it is with academia and making sure we have good relationships with, uh, with academic institutions around the country, and, and he's expanded that as well. So a separate but related issue to the adopting new technology and keeping up, uh, the troops we have now have done multiple tours. Our equipment's been used uh, repeatedly. Uh, would you comment on, uh, you know, and we've also heard we need to quote unquote rebuild the military. Uh, you commented on the quality of the troops, but how about just the, the uh, I guess, you know, their uh, endurance and then the equipment itself. What, what condition sure. is that in today? You know, on the people side, um, I think most of us in 2001, 2002 would have said that you can't actually expect the all-volunteer force to be at war for over 15 years and to do all we've asked our young men and women to do and have them have the same level of commitment, the same level of discipline, the same level of morale uh, that we have today. And I don't take that for granted. And where we see some of the wear and tear is certainly in our families. We see it in our, some of the challenges that we have with mental health. And, and those are things that we're, we're addressing. And we're also trying to uh, pull back the throttle, so to speak, so we can manage time at home and time deployed uh, a little bit more effectively than we have over the last several years. I mean, operational requirements have been what they are. We have to meet our requirements, and we have met those, but we have run the force pretty hard. What I mentioned in my opening remarks is that today we have a competitive advantage. But again, uh, what we have done is we have slid, we call it a bow wave, but we have slid a lot of our modernization to the right, meaning we've delayed it. Because as we dealt with those budget challenges, we made a conscious decision to make sure we could meet today's operational requirement, again, with an assumption that maybe in a few years the budget situation will be uh, better and we'll be in a position then to invest in procurement. If you took the Marine Corps when I was, uh, when I was a commandant, we, uh, we were spending about 7% on modernization. Uh, and historically, we had spent about 12 or 14 percent, and that even was, was on the margins. We never spent as much in modernization as we should, but it was almost half of what it typically was as we dealt with those budget challenges of 2012, 13, 14, and 15. 
And for that reason, uh, trying to get the right balance between meeting today's requirements and tomorrow's requirements has been a, a big focus over the last two years. And last year, for the first time, you know, we, we really did change our assumption. We said, look, the budget is unlikely to get much better. We need to make the hard calls now, and we need to start making some investments in tomorrow, even as we fight the fight in places like Iraq and Syria, Libya, and Afghanistan. And we did that. And so last year, as a result, we had delayed modernization of the nuclear enterprise, as an example. It's probably about about 15 years delayed, and we started to make those investments last year. We increased our, our investment in space resilience. We increased our capabilities in cyberspace, electronic warfare, and some of the other areas that weren't necessarily pressing as we focused on the challenges of Iraq and Afghanistan. But again, if you look at things through the lens of the four plus one and you say you have to have balanced capabilities, those are areas where we were out of balance and we need, to, we need to kind of adjust. So I think the two areas that you address are really the, you know, the human factors piece is one where I think some rebalancing needs to take place and all the service chiefs are working pretty hard on that to come up with you know, what I call a sustained rate of fire, right? I mean, if we, those of us that are infantrymen, you know if you, if you use a machine gun at the cyclic rate, you quickly burn out the barrel and that's why you have the sustained rate of fire. And I think the force has been running pretty hard, if not cyclic at the rapid rate here over the last few years and, we, and we've, got to, we've got to settle that down a little bit. And then we also, again, have to start making investments informed by both what we need today and what we need tomorrow. Hey, General, just before our meeting, you met with a number of high school students who are in international uh, study. And with the political discourse we've seen the last year, uh, public service uh, to many looks like a pretty uh, volatile career. Uh, and we're also getting, I understand, less than 1% serving in the active duty military. Could you comment on how you encourage people to, not only the military, but public service, and how you see that going forward? Because we could have all the innovative technology we want, and if we don't have the best and the brightest in the military, uh, we'll be behind either no, way. I, Barry, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and to be honest with you, again, I'm able to say that we have a competitive advantage today uh, first and foremost because of the quality of people that we recruit and retain. So that, that, that is absolutely the foundation uh, of the joint force today. And, uh, and we are w working pretty hard in that regard. I, I think on the uniform side, uh, at least to date, we haven't really seen, uh, we haven't seen a, down, a downturn in recruiting the kind of people we want to have. The civilian side, I am, I am actually uh, as worried about or perhaps more worried about young people being incentivized to come and serve our government in a wide range of capacities, whether it's in the State Department, the Department of Defense, Department of Justice, up on Capitol Hill, wherever it happens to be. And, uh, and one of the things I've seen is, you know, each year now, for the last four or five years, we haven't had a budget at the end of the year. And so there's been furloughs and layoffs and those kinds of things. And so what I always describe is you get the young student who maybe went to George Washington, went to Harvard, went to Yale, went to Virginia Tech, whatever the case may be, and joins government and then 10 months later they get laid off and then next year it's the same thing and it's always the uncertainty. And, uh, and it becomes a disincentive. And then the public discourse has become so coarse that you worry that people would be disincentivized for government service in that regard as well. And so I've spent a lot of time, and Secretary Carter certainly has. In fact, I, I spoke to a group of bright graduate students just last Thursday and, and made a pitch for, uh, for, for government service. And I said, look, the one thing I, I'm sure I can't promise you is tangible rewards that will compete with the private sector. And you don't have to do this forever. You can do it just for a period of time. But in my, in my own judgment, the intangible rewards of service, the opportunity to work on things that are incredibly important to our nation, to our way of life, uh, is important. The quality of people that you have an opportunity to serve with, in some cases, the level of responsibility that we give young people, I think, is, is, uh, is different, certainly, than, uh, than in some other walks of life. And so we've worked pretty hard to, uh, you know, to kind of articulate, you know, what it is about service that's different. And frankly, it is largely about the intangibles. But someone, people even ask me, they say, hey, you know, how, how do you like the job you're in? And um, what I tell people is that, you know, despite the fact that we are in very challenging times, I would much rather be where I am trying to help solve these problems than watching it all unfold from the outside 
and feel completely helpless that I can actually make a contribution. And to me, uh, you know, that's what government service is all about. That's what General Maya did, Secretary Schultz, Secretary Perry. Uh, that's what government service is all about is it's the opportunity to go in and work on very important, very significant challenges that affect our nation, our way of life, our vital national interests. And, uh, and I think that's probably the one unique thing we have uh, in government is the nature of the problems that you're working on. And so I you know, would encourage those maybe uh, on the front end of their lives to serve for a period of time and then they can go into private sector if that's what they decide to do or they can continue in, in, the, in the public sector as I have. But then there's also a number of people that, that uh, again, this is something Secretary Andy Carter and I have spoken about, that maybe have never served and now are, are at the point in life where they have the flexibility to go off and do something different, to do something for the country, and maybe they're in their late 40s or 50s or 60s, been successful in another walk of life and have an opportunity to serve. And I would say there's, there's plenty of opportunities to do that as well. Uh, General, one last question. Uh, we have a unique uh, opportunity here. General Dunford is the only Marine in the history of the Marine Corps to serve as Commandant of the Marine Corps and then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So uh, last question would be, could you just contrast the differences of being Commandant versus Chairman of the Joint Chiefs? And what were your, the two things that kept you awake at night as Commandant and then the difference in Joint Chiefs? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you didn't make me in public say which job I'd prefer to have. I, <laughs> I, 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 was, I, was, I was actually afraid that was coming, and I'd, have to, and I'd have to answer that question honestly, but you didn't ask me that question. Um, it, it is, it is a, a difference. You know, as a, as, a, uh, as a service chief, as the commandant of the Marine Corps, you're focused on training, organizing, equipping United States Marines. You're focused on providing our combatant commanders with highly capable formations, Marine Expeditionary Units, Marine Expeditionary Forces, Special Purpose Marine Air Ground Task Forces, provide the State Department with 1,600 great young Americans to support the State Department. So your, your primary responsibility is making Marines, equipping them, training them, and send them out to go do the great things that Marines do all around the world. Clearly, as someone who grew up inside the institution, and had been the assistant commandant and had spent a lot of time in various jobs in the Marine Corps. That's a pretty comfortable job. And, and uh, you know, I would tell you there, there weren't a lot of surprises for me uh, as the commandant of the Marine Corps. And what I was doing was fairly predictable, even if what the Marines were doing wasn't necessarily predictable. What I was doing uh, as a service chief was, was important. I did focus. We've talked about people a lot. I think first and foremost, uh, the number one uh, thing I focused on was making sure that we were getting the right young men and women uh, to join the Corps, and then making sure that we were conducting the transformation process of making Marines in the right way. That's the most, if you get that right, you can kind of muddle your way through the rest. That's the key piece. You get the right people in there and you give them the right training. The rest of it, you'll, it'll all solve itself. Uh, and, and the number one challenge that I, I felt like we had at the time was uh, we had a shortage of non-commissioned officers because of our model and, uh, and what, what I was advocating for and what General Neller, who's, who's doing a great job as our commandant, and, and uh, we've got a great sergeant major as well. What they're focused on is what we started to do, which is was kind of mature the force a little bit. You know, our average non-commissioned officers uh, were probably at the three-year, three-and-a-half-year mark, and we're trying to move that to the five- or six-year mark simply because to get the training, the education, the experience you need to lead at that level and to make the kinds of decisions that they have to make at that level, it's much different. And uh, when I look back at uh, my days as a lieutenant, what sergeants are doing today absolutely is what lieutenants were doing uh, when I was a lieutenant. And what our staff non-commissioned officers have done over the past 10 or 15 years in combat is extraordinary. And the challenges that, that we have put on them and that they have met are much different than they were in the past. And that's all about making sure you get the right people and you, and you provide the right training. In the job I'm in right now, there's, there's probably uh, you know, two things that uh, are important to me. Number, you know, number one is providing the president with best military advice and making sure that when we do send young men and women in harm's way, that we do it against a clear political objective and we, we send them in with the wherewithal to accomplish the mission with minimal loss of life or equipment. And that's, you know, that's, that's what drives us in providing best military advice is making sure we give the president viable options to meet his policy objectives and we give our young men and women in the joint force the tools they need to get the job done. The, uh, the world has unfolded. My first weekend in the job, the very first weekend I was in the job, I took the job on a Friday. The Russians went into Syria that weekend. We had Hurricane Joaquin. 
and uh, and there was some other minor flail that I even forget now, and that was the first 48 hours in the job. And so it's very unpredictable, uh, very unpredictable. And I look back over the past year, and uh, things have unfolded in a way that that you know I couldn't possibly have imagined, and uh, and that's every day. And, uh, and I think what, what keeps me awake right now is just making sure that uh, we do the best we can to anticipate and not to react. And, and again, that, uh, that we pay attention to what we're doing in places where we have young men and women in harm's way, in places like Iraq, in places like Syria, in places like Afghanistan, in places like Libya, East Africa, and West Africa, all of which have young Americans in harm's way. Uh, that we're doing that we're doing the right thing, and uh, and that's that's the that's the thing that keeps me awake at night is making sure that I don't disappoint them. And then the, the second piece of it is that balance I spoke about earlier, which I think is is my number one uh, challenge uh, in this job. We'll make sure that through the four years we maintain the right balance between uh, enabling the force that we have today to get the job done and building the force that we need tomorrow. And we can't afford to do that sequentially. We've got to be able to do it simultaneously. And getting that balance right every day is, is also difficult in the current budget environment, but it's something that we have to do. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Secretary Schultz, General Dunford, and Barry Graham for a great presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.